uh, glad to have you with us. This is the launch of the bank, the mine, the colony, the crime, a virtual version of a walking tour that we at the Reimagining Value Action Lab and Walking Lab organized last October and is now being brought to you uh, online as something that you yourself can uh, undertake, uh, if you so choose, in the city of Toronto or beyond it to explore the intersections of settler colonialism, financialization, and the extractive industries. My name is Max Haven, and I'm Canada Research Chair in Culture, Media, and Social Justice at Lakehead University, and I'm joined from Walking Lab by Stephanie Springay at McMaster University and Sarah Truman at University of Melbourne, who will introduce themselves in a moment. I'll simply say that the Reimagining Value Action Lab is a workshop for the radical imagination, social justice, and decolonization located physically on Anishinaabe territories uh, on the North Shore of what we today call Lake Superior. Uh, and we're very pleased to be working with Walking Lab and having worked with them over the past year on this tour, uh, which occurred, as I mentioned, in October and involved uh, a range of speakers, artists, activists, and academics presenting their work, their research, their uh, activist work at a variety of locales around uh, the proverbial Bay Street, which is to say the financial district of the city we know today as Toronto in uh, on unceded and unsurrendered Indigenous territories. Um, before maybe going into that, I'd, I'd just welcome my co-hosts to say a few words of introduction. Hi, I'm Stephanie Springay. So I'm the director of the School of the Arts and a professor at McMaster University. I'm also the co-director of Walking Lab with Sarah Truman. And Sarah's going to tell you a little bit more about Walking Lab and introduce herself. Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Truman, uh, currently in lockdown in Melbourne and I just gave myself a haircut as you can see. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that I'm currently living and working on, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and acknowledge that this land has not been ceded. Um, I'm going to share my screen and just bring you to the Walking Lab website. So uh, Walking Lab is a queer feminist art collective co-directed by Stephanie Springay, who you just met, and myself. Um, we developed research creation walking events internationally with diverse publics. We also investigate walking as a research method in the social sciences and the arts, and uh, research the relationship between movement and pedagogy. Um, our scholarship and curatorial practices draw on feminist theory theories, critical race theories, queer and trans theories, disability studies, and anti-colonialisms um, to challenge conventional approaches to walking scholarship. So one of the major tropes in walking scholarships that's still overused and mobilized is the figure of the flanner. Uh, and we contend that this is a problematic trope um, in that the flanner is conditioned by autonomy, ability, whiteness, masculinity, and uh, as such can move throughout the cities or places detached from the immediate surroundings. Um, and so a lot of our scholarship and our walks uh, counter this overused figure um, through framing our research through critical walking methodologies. And this criticality assumes that walking is not necessarily convivial, it's not necessarily always embodied, um, it's not necessarily always inclusive and not necessarily always a depoliticized deep mode of conducting research or moving through the city. Um, and so we've uh, conducted walks on various different countries and different cities. You can see them on our website, um, as well as our publications are also visible on our website. And I think Max is now going to talk about a specific walk that we organized with Rival and I'm gonna keep screen sharing. Thank you so much. So yes, the walk which occurred in October was called The Bank, The Mine, The Colony, The Crime, a collaborative walking tour of Toronto's financial district to unsettle finance extraction and racial capitalism. Uh, some of these other terms will hopefully be uh, quite familiar to many, many of you, especially in terms of the extractive industries, by which we mean those that are tasked with ripping things out of the earth uh, with great environmental and social consequences, uh, racial capitalism uh, and settler colonialism being the forces that enable and are enabled by 
um, these forms of extraction. Uh, we wanted to focus on Bay Street in Toronto because it is the home of uh, Canada's financial elite, the financial corporations that have an outsized influence on um, Canadian settler colonial policy and the other forms of structural, systemic, and direct violence that the settler colonial state of Canada exacts on Indigenous people and communities and other communities as well all around the world. Uh, financialization uh, is a term that has many different definitions. Um, on the basic level, we can understand it as the incredible power that banks, financial institutions, insurance companies, and especially the real estate market have on the global capitalist economy as a whole. But much more deeply than that, we can also understand it as something profound that's happening to our society and to culture more generally. So we can think about, for instance, the financialization of higher education, uh, where increasingly students are told to see education as a quote unquote investment in their own personal futures. Or we can think about the way that gentrification in cities, another form of extraction in many ways, is driven by the financialization of housing, where something as basic as our uh, right to shelter is transformed into an object of speculation for the rich and the powerful. And so we wanted to organize this tour to explore these very important intersections that are really often invisibilized to us or hidden behind the pages of the business newspapers, uh, but that can be seen and experienced in the, um, in the actual space the architectures and the built environment of a downtown core like Toronto's. Um, and to do so, we brought together a really special and very talented group of interlocutors uh, to discuss this. And we're not gonna go through all of their names and projects right now. We'd really encourage you to check out uh, the website, which can be found uh, presently at reimagininvalue.ca and will be mirrored soon on the Walking Lab website as well. Uh, there you can do a number of different things. You can see the biographies and a short abstract from each of the presenters, but you can also use a built-in Google map in order to see uh, the locations where they spoke and even use Google street maps in order to actually see it if you don't happen to be in Toronto. If you are in Toronto, you can visit those locations. And while you're at those locations, either physically or virtually, you are welcome to go to the SoundCloud links, which are there on the website as well, and use them to listen to uh, an audio recording of all of our speakers. Uh, the whole tour should take around one and a half to two hours, depending on how you do it. There's not a lot of walking in it, uh, and the tour leads you through a number of sites and a bit of a loop around uh, the area near Union Station is, uh, is one of the landmarks. Um, that that is, is quite central to what we, uh, what we planned. Um, the speakers are speaking on a wide range of things, so only some of which um, touch the question of financialization, all point towards financialization and are implicated in financialization. But we have speakers, for instance, talking about the gentrification of queer spaces. We have speakers speaking about safe injection sites, speakers speaking about the broader uh, spectrum of indigenous resistance into Toronto and beyond to settler colonialism and the extractive industries. And also speakers speaking about the architecture or uh, activism in Mexico and here in Canada um, against mining companies and their abuses. It's a very eclectic uh, tour, which I know I learned a great deal about. Um, and I think I, I wanted to uh, now in some ways um, turn a question over to the Walking Lab folks because um, it's been a really interesting experience working with you to try and think through these ideas in terms of walking. I had been inspired by a uh, walking tour that I had organized uh, about a year and a bit prior to that uh, with my colleague Aris Komporosos Athanasiou in, uh, at the uh, University College London uh, about financialization in the city of London. That's to say the uh, financial district of London, the world capital uh, and the capital of Britain's empire uh, in both in previous centuries and today. Uh, but I think working with you folks, it had, I really learned a great deal about how, how expansive the walking methodology can be and how it can really bring people uh, together across a lot of lines of diversity, a lot of lines of power to explore ideas in ways that they might not have uh, explored it together before. 
So I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about uh, organizing these large public walking tours from a queer and decolonial perspective as you do. What have you folks done in the past that led to the walking tour that we organized together? Um, yeah, so that's um, our method that we call the queer walking tours. So um, normative walking tours, how we've looked at them and, and researched them take place in specific locations and they often reinforce um, settler logics um, and dominant histories. So we developed a method that we call the queer walking tours to advocate for a critical consideration of place and, and place making. And this criticality um, not only recognizes place as socially and culturally and geosocially um, constructed, but also considers place-based processes of colonization and settler colonization. Um, and we call them queer walking tours to mobilize queerness in various senses. So um, gen gender and sexuality identities, um, rupturing progress narratives, um, like I feel like we did in the um, Bank of Mind um, walking tour, uh, and then obliquely or queerly taking up a concept in relation to a place and defamiliarizing how walking is framed in, in, in these processes. Um, and uh, we always want to note that um, we work against reducing the notion of uh, queerness uh, to an exceptionalism. Um, so we're, we're, we are critical of the whiteness that comes alongside with queer calls for transgression. Um, so to, to run our tours, we begin with a proposition. We, we like to work conceptually. Um, but we begin with the proposition of a physical location. And then propositionally, we move from the research being about the specific surface of the walk to a concept. Um, and so we take the concept to cut across the geographic place. And then we invite scholars and artists and activists to create pop-up lectures based around that concept. And so it's, turns out to be kind of a queer mobile symposium of experts in various different oblique angles on a place. Um, and like you've just said, Max, um, when we were thinking about working on this with you, um, we, we were thinking alongside of, of financialization, but also extraction as a concept. And a lot of the people that came and, and gave uh, lectures and talks were thinking about it, the extractive aspects of um, financialization. So the location was the financial district um, um, and the concept was extraction. And we've run other walks like this in other places. We did one in um, Edinburgh and the concept was deep time. Um, we, we've done one um, in Hamilton, Ontario, um, querying the notion of a trail. And so, um, yeah, we've written about this also in an uh, article in Cultural Geographies, and that's uh, available on the Walking Lab website if people want to read about the method. Thanks, Sarah. That's great. So, Max, as Sarah was talking about how um, we at Walking Lab have kind of formulated our, our particular or one particular method that we use around these like large scale public walking tours. Um, and you mentioned earlier that you'd done a walk previously in the UK. Um, I'm just curious, like what, what is it about the format of a collaborative walking tour that's useful for thinking about financialization and extraction? Uh, it's been so interesting working with you and working with all the collaborators on this tour and, and the previous tour that we did in London um, to think through precisely this question. I think, Part of finance finances power, and it has incredible power to shape the movements of goods and services around the globe, to shape uh, work and life for practically everyone on the planet. Part of its power comes from its ability to mystify itself. Uh, you know, I, I think since 2008, when we all learned about the kind of depravities of finance and the weird necromancy that goes on on Wall Street and the strange derivative products that get cooked up to make sort of hallucinate money out of money, uh, it quickly seems to become so complex and convoluted, no one can make sense of it. 
And ultimately, I think that that mystification is busted or blown open when we actually come together in space and see its impacts and effects. And we look at its architectures and we realize that financialization is, in fact, a phenomenon that's going on all around us. Financialization was what built the settler colonial uh, state of Canada in many ways. It was capital from around the world, especially from the United Kingdom what would become the United Kingdom, that flowed into this space and funded the building of cities like Toronto. It was the marshalling of global capital that built the architectures that today loom over um, Bay Street in Toronto and that continue to enable the kind of violence of the Canadian mining industry, which around the world is is uh, guilty of heinous atrocities against indigenous people, peasants, and uh, poor and working people the world over, including, I should mention, atrocities that are highly, highly uh, calibrated by gender, uh, where human rights, uh, indigenous and, and land defenders are specifically targeted by mining, mining industries when they pose a risk to profit. So I think coming together in the physical space allows us in some way to demystify it. And I think also in a way, as I maybe alluded to earlier, there's a way that financialization seeps into all social institutions, including, unfortunately, academia, the arts, uh, even the NGO side of activism. And part of that is a push towards a kind of individualization, a kind of siloing of, of people into special areas of interest, a sense that we're all constantly hustling to survive and get ahead. And what I liked so much about doing the walking tours um, was that it kind of challenged the ways in which we've internalized financialization ourselves. It challenged, you know, it, for, for those of us who are academics, it was not a conventional, you know, do some research, publish a paper, get the academic capital, go home, etc. It was actually, it felt much more collaborative. It flattened the hierarchies and to a certain extent. For artists, it was something they could contribute to that wasn't just about, you know, the, the standard circuits of producing artistic and subcultural value. And so I think ultimately in a world that we're constantly fragmented by the institutions that are so um, impacted by financialization, the tour really felt like a methodology that I'm not, I'm not sure how, how much it can really challenge it, but gives us a, sh a short, sharp view of what a different world might look like. Um, yeah, so I think it, it's a very appropriate methodology for thinking about financialization. Mm -hmm. And I have a question for you folks, but just before I, say, uh, I mention it, I, I, I'm, I was remiss in forgetting to mention at the beginning of our session that if there are those who are watching on YouTube, uh, you're welcome to pose questions to us, which we'd be happy to answer in the comments section on YouTube. We'll try and uh, get to them this session, although we're also trying to keep it short. So yes, if you're watching on YouTube, please use the comment section and, and we'd be happy to try and answer some of those questions. Um, I think my, 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 the question you posed to me really leads on to the question I have, next question I have for you, which is why walking methods are so important at this time. A uh, time when we all are told to, you know, stay in our homes and, uh, <laughs> uh, but also many people are learning the joys of walking uh, in totally yeah. new ways. Yeah. So I, I guess my response to that is a little bit pre-pandemic as well as like taking it up now, but um, over the past, you know, decade there's been this renewed interest. Walking has a long history in both the arts practices as well as the social sciences, but there has been a really strong renewed interest. And I think some of it touches on the ways in which you were talking about why it lended to the question of financialization and extractivism. And it has a lot to do with the notion of situated uh, inquiry, right? So that when, when ash, a, actually asking questions about a particular concept, phenomena, or place, that one can actually go and move through that place. And so there's sort of that situated and relational construct of walking methods. It's very site responsive. Uh, so one of the things that's interesting as Sarah described earlier in our method is that we, we tend to start with a concept and then we tend to start with, well, who are we going to invite to come and tease out some 
uh, various ways to think about this concept. And we're not looking for everyone to kind of come at this in like in a similar way, but as Sarah explained in this sort of oblique fashion. Um, but the site responsiveness is also embedded in it because it's very much, and at least in this instance, about this Bay Street, about Toronto. And so there's something about that location, about the localness, et cetera. And as Sarah explained, we've done this in many places and there's a concept like deep time, but then deep time was very much embedded in the geology and the history of deep time um, and um, the, the, the location of Edinburgh. There's also something about walking that is about its immediacy, maybe. It's, um, it's about mobility. And we also take up issues around ableism around that. And so when we designed the actual physical financialization walk, uh, we took into um, consideration accessibility, um, the pavement cutouts, all kinds of other things around who could walk where and when. We also thought about the ways in which we were inviting a diverse body of publics to this walk, both as speakers and as participants or guests um, who are often not welcome to the financial district. And we experienced a little bit of that on the live performance day. Um, and so those are, there, there's something that, that we can kind of unsettle space in places that we're not normally invited or allowed to be. There's something about being there as a group that can maybe kind of intervene even if it's not permanently but for a moment in space um, time. Um, one of the other things that I think you touched upon uh, Max in your last uh, response was also about the way in which walking lab and I think Rival is trying to do the same. We're just really trying um, to challenge the value and status of knowledge and what counts as research academically and then even within art spaces, educational spaces, et cetera. And so there's this long history in, um, in research of extraction itself, which is kind of interesting that then the topic was extraction. So you extract data, you analyze data in your lab or back in your research office or whatever, and then you disseminate knowledge. And so for Walking Lab as a research creation practice, it's really about entangling all of this. This was a research, artistic, pedagogical, walking performance. Um, and it was at the same time a site of what we would call as academics knowledge dissemination and community outreach, community engagement. And so rather than these kind of like values or static definitions and pockets of the way things appear, uh, as academic knowledge, we're trying to really sort of uh, entangle that, mess with that, uh, make it strange, uh, and make it do wonderful things that other people can't make sense of at times, or um, allows diverse publics to actually enter into instead of it being um, the kind of behind the paywall, paywall academic um, public publication. So. Um, so one of the things that I was wondering is, Rival, could you, Max, could you explain how Rival's responding to this moment of the COVID um, in terms of research and community? Well, um, as best we can, I mean, I think it's difficult for, for so many uh, of us on our initiatives. Uh, a lot of what, so Rival sort of has two faces. Um, a local face and a global face. And, and part of what we worked on with you folks was our sort of global face where we work with collaborators around the world to put on events, to do academic research, to do public, um, public education and explorations. We also do a lot of activities in uh, Thunder Bay. And for those viewers who maybe are not from uh, the territories currently called Canada, or unfamiliar, Thunder Bay has recently, but rightly gained a reputation for being one of the most racist and most violently racist places in Canada. A lot of that violence includes uh, members of the city's power establishment, including the police. Uh, two independent reports recently had found that the Thunder Bay police uh, are, are uh, guilty of systemic racism against indigenous people who represent somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of the, the population of Thunder Bay. So a lot of the work that we've been doing over the past few years has been simply trying to chip away at, by any means necessary, the kind of 
ideological structures of white supremacy and settler colonialism that so animate that space. Uh, and we've done that through reading groups where we invite anyone to come and discuss these issues. We've done it through sort of bystander intervention trainings. We've done it through uh, bringing in visiting speakers, uh, by doing activism workshops to really try and empower the community. Uh, so that work we continue to do and we're trying to roll out a, a, a new way of doing it online in the fall. And I think what we're noticing is that in a certain way that provides many limitations, but in another way one is, when one is doing uh, anti-racist education in a locale like Thunder Bay, uh, the online uh, possibilities in this COVID moment are maybe not as much of a drawback as we thought. Lots of people were very uncomfortable coming out to events for all variety of reasons, because they didn't feel safe, they didn't want to be seen, they wanted more anonymity. Um, so we're in the, this coming fall, we're planning a lot of activities that respond to that and respond specifically to the ways in which COVID-19 presents a particular threat to indigenous communities who are already uh, marginalized and made susceptible to uh, adverse health outcomes uh, already by the structures of settler colonialism and racism. So we're doing that. We also just launched a new series of pamphlets, radical pamphlets to uh, fan the flames of discontent, uh, both of which are dedicated to ex uh, giving us a, a bit more depth in our explorations of uh, co the COVID-19 pandemic and helping us re-theorize them. One is by the great uh, Australian theorist, uh, Angela Metropolis, a new pamphlet called Pandemonium about uh, the way in which the pandemic has been mobilized by not only sort of arch conservative and reactionary governments, but also by liberal capitalist governments and much to the same effect to entrench the patterns of neoliberal and neoconservative uh, power that have been growing over the last 40 years. So uh, um, a bracing but very important read. And the other by Rivals co-director Cassie Thornton uh, called The Hologram about a socially engaged art project she's been working on over the last couple of years um that puts uh participants together in groups of four where three people focus their attention on the health and well-being of a of a, of a four uh as a kind of alternative model uh, and a form of grassroots peer-to-peer -peer care that uh became especially important for the participants in that project in the last few months of the pandemic when they felt uh rightly that so many of the either bureaucratized or neoliberalized or privatized systems of care on offer in this pandemic uh, were unable to meet people's needs. So a real vision of what mutual aid might look like uh, during, before, during, and after the pandemic. Uh, so these are some of the initiatives that we're working on right now, uh, as well as, of course, like everyone, moving a lot of our activities online yeah. uh, for the fall. Um, and just a reminder that if you have questions uh, to please put them in the questions or in the in the comment section here on YouTube. Um, I I would turn the question back to you folks. Uh, how's Walking Lab responding to uh, COVID and the challenges and opportunities that it poses, and specifically around the work that you've already been doing around anti-racism and anti-colonialism, and the ways in which you you so um, deftly navigate and and tra uh, transgress these lines that tend to separate research, teaching, and institutional spaces. Yeah. So it was interesting because right as the pandemic hit in North America in the Toronto area, and we all went into uh, a kind of crisis pedagogy and crisis mode and um, a, a, a kind of informal isolation. Um, we also received news that we received a new grant. And at first we were a little perplexed, you know, we, we do this work that's walking with publics, with diverse communities. This one was specifically looking at like critical place inquiry and while working with artists again and and Walking Lab curating their own large public projects, it had a, a strong component that would be working with K to 12 teachers, both in Australia and Melbourne with Sarah, and then in Toronto with myself. Um, and so we had to actually sort of think about, well, what, what can we do in the meantime that doesn't, that isn't something, uh, like that isn't uh, moving away from the intention and the ethics that we're really invested in in Walking Lab. 
And one of the things that Walking Lab has been really, as I was mentioning before, um, and across all of my research projects, I, I'm really interested in destabilizing the way in which we value knowledge and research and inquiry in institutional spaces. And so we thought about the fact that over the last number of years, Sarah and I have Walking Lab, we've published a number of academic we have a book that's come out, we have a whole series of academic articles, and they serve a particular purpose. They're, they're, I mean, we both love to write, we both, both love to think theory, and it's a way for us to actually think critically about these concepts and, and about our method. But I'm also really aware of the notion of access and pedagogy. So we have been spending the time in COVID to um, take all of our academic publications and we've been writing them into podcast scripts with the help of David Ben Shannon, who's a walking lab collaborator based in Manchester, uh, just finishing an amazing PhD there in sound studies um, and dis critical disability studies. And so the three of us have been um, taking these academic publications and distilling them into less than 10 minute segments um, for what we would consider to be sort of an undergraduate audience. Um, but then I also have this amazing, amazing contact. Uh, also, uh, they are a PhD um, candidate student at the University of Toronto, Jay Wallace. And uh, they, um, make amazing graphic representations of academic text. So the kind of the idea is that we would be able to continue to think about diversity of audiences and make things accessible. So the podcast eventually will be on iTunes and on the website and PDF um, downloadable uh, graphic representations of the of the academic material and so really we've been thinking a lot about form and how to how the community these diverse communities that we walk with don't want to read these academic articles um, and even maybe some of our academic friends are tired of reading them there's something about like we're so overwhelmed with zoom and the length of online modalities that we've been trying to think about these different formats and different pedagogical ways to get this out into the community and of course this is also like in keeping with sort of the like non-extractivism and um, anti-racism and anti-colonial work and thinking around um, the ways in which particular knowledge is valued and to try and actually kind of intervene into what it what counts as um, scholarship or curricular materials etc so those are just some of the things that we've been doing right now I don't know Sarah do you want to add anything I think you captured it okay thank you <laughs> You're, Sarah, you're the last question, though. I muted myself again. Um, well, <laughs> I, was, I think Max, you started to touch on it, but are there any upcoming specific projects that you wanted to to talk about that you're that you're working on at Rival? Maybe just two that I'll mention quickly because they tie into our project. One of them is a second project with uh, my colleague Aris Comparoso Safanasiu, with whom I organized the um, walking tour of London. And we became interested together doing that tour and our work on financialization on, you know, um, what do we make of a generation of young people who've grown up knowing nothing but financialization? And how can we think through what powers and abilities and ideas they might have that those of us who maybe experienced a world before financialization, or at least the shadow of a world before financialization, don't have. And this led us to a very curious place, which is to um, look at what has been framed in the media as the epidemic of student anxiety in this moment, which none of us who work in a university or have loved ones who are students or faculty in universities can have uh, avoided. Uh, it is a huge, a huge challenge for many, many students uh, and for many teachers as well. And we've wanted to ask the question, well, what's the connection between this uh, meteoric rise in this thing we call anxiety and financialization? And to do that, Aris and I have been doing a series of uh, interviews on a new podcast we have called The Order of Unmanageable Risks, uh, which can be found at the URL anxious.community. Or if you search in podcasting apps for the order of unmanageable risks, you should be able to find it. It's also on the same SoundCloud 
uh, platform as our walking tour so people can navigate it towards it for that. And we're gonna to continue to do research in, uh, into this question of, of anxiety uh, and financialization in a moment when of course all of our anxiety levels have precipitously increased and will increase again as we enter into a new school term uh, for those of us in the hemispheres where the school term begins in early, uh, late August and early September. The other project that I think ties to what we're speaking about today is that uh, we were fortunate enough at Rival to be able to partner with the Thunder Bay Public Library and get a grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada to explore the question of rematriation of land to uh, Indigenous people. In the case of Thunder Bay, it's the Anishinaabe people whose uh, traditional lands have been stolen. And we're working with local uh, Anishinaabe thinkers and elders, as well as a mixed Indigenous, non-Indigenous research team uh, between the library and our lab to really try and explore what it would mean to give the land back. Uh, and by that, I don't just mean that settler institutions would out of the goodness of their heart give it back in some sort of uh, philanthropic way, but actually how that could be um, a, a process that included both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people working together towards some sort of future together beyond the logics of the colonial settler state and its economic and financial institutions. And thinking that through the institution of the library as a space that's valued by many members of our community for a whole variety of reasons, uh, not only because it happens to contain books, but because it's a, a space of shelter, a space of, uh, of retreat, a uh, space of meeting, um, and a space that occupies sacred land. Um, so it's a difficult and interesting project that we're engaged in a multi-year project. Um, and so I'm very excited about that as well. And one of the methods we would love to use in that project is uh, to develop walking tours. Uh, and so we'll be in touch with you folks to help us figure <laughs> out how to do it. Fabulous. In, in a future where we can travel. Yes. Thunder Bay. <laughs> yes. We exactly. look forward to welcoming you yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you. This has been fabulous. I, I don't know if there's any questions that came via the the YouTube channel. Did people find us after we shifted channels? Yes, several people found us. So, uh, but none have yet put questions. It's partly That's because there's a little bit of a delay. So, uh, if you did send a question, we will we'll email you a personal response. All right. Well, I guess I just want to say on behalf of Walking Lab, thank you to everyone for. Um, showing up tonight uh, Thursday night in August and uh, please check out the the tour yes thank you and thanks to uh, both of you for uh, this great collaboration and looking forward to future ones yeah. as well yeah exactly okay thank you <laughs>